of uh, of subtraction. So if you do an if you do an NLO calculation, um, you have the born you have the born part. If the born part diverges, which is possible, it means that you forgot a cut. Okay. So for example, if you want to calculate a two jet cross section and you forget to demand that your jets must have a transverse momentum, this thing here will already diverge. Yeah, so even at Born level you can have divergences, but if you have the divergences, it tells you that what you try to calculate is unphysical. Okay? So, in a code like MathGraph, they put by default cuts to prevent you from being stupid. <laughs> in Sharpa, you don't get them. If you're stupid, you will see it. You can, I, I'm not sure what is the better option, um, but um, well, you, you don't get sane looking results for something that in your setup was not sane. On the other hand, well, you have to think sometimes, not optimal. Okay, I think you did a lot of, cal of how to calculate the virtuals, and you know they have um, infrared and ultraviol ultraviolet divergences divergences. The ultraviolet ones are kind of straightforward. They're textbook material. You will have seen this in your, in your quantum field theory lectures. So in a way, and then you have the infrared ones which also exist in the real. Now, the problem is when you look at the phase space integrals, Born and virtual have Born kinematics, so it's an n body. The real kinematics is n plus 1. And that means if you want to cancel the divergences between those, you have to kind of connect two different phase spaces, the born one, n body, and the real one, n plus one. And if you want to do your phase space integration in the computer, which most people do beyond uh, 222 or 223 processes, then you, you have a problem. Now, there have been different methods of how to do that. In the old days, people cut the divergences in a way, and um, so it's a method called phase space slicing. That is not how people do it anymore at next leading order. At next leading order, what people do is um, <coughs> they define subtraction terms where you locally subtract on a phase space by phase space point level the, di the infrared divergences in the real. And then you integrate these guys over the, over the one extra particle phase space. So you, you map them from n plus 1 to an n-body phase space. So you integrate them over one particle. You get, you get your divergence is now integrated out. You add them to that. So, so the 1 over epsilon squared and 1 over epsilon terms that we had in the previous slide, these guys here, Yeah, they are part of your subtraction. You see them in integrated form here. So, so, so you do the map, um, you do the mapping from here to here. And these guys here, these are the ones, plus some finite terms. That's that's it in here. Okay. Now, the the catch is. In principle, you could do this by inspection, process by process, and this is how people did it in the, um, in the early days. But it turns out that you can write your subtraction terms in such a way <coughs> that you say, my subtraction term here factorizes in a form where I have a born, where I have a born type um, kinematics. It doesn't have to, it can, it can be more than one different kinematics, and I come back to that. And you have a subtraction term where you have an extra, your extra phase space factored out and you have some more or less implicit dependence on, on the Born kinematics. Now, I, I put this, this funny product here because if you think about it, let's say, let's say you, do, you have a four or five body final state. It's entirely possible that you want to combine an extra gluon with any of the four or five other particles. And that would lead you, that would give you possibly four or five different kinematical configurations because you more or less add the momenta, if that makes sense. Yeah? That's why it's not like one term, this, this subtraction term here is a sum of, of an implicit sum of many individual subtractions where you go pairwise over your particles and try to, 
to identify your divergences, okay? Now, this has been automated <coughs> for, for next to leading order, and that is one of the reasons why we can, um, why we can calculate cross-sections. Um, Kieran, I think, talked quite a lot about what we did to, to do the loops in a much more automated way, so I'm not going back to that. I, I just want to make one comment here. Naively, you would say, okay, next leading order has been backed about 10 years ago. How about next to next to leading order? The problem with next to next to leading order is the following. First of all, the integrals are much more complicated, and it's not entirely clear whether we have them all. So for next to leading order, we have an, a basis of, of, you know, master integrals, and we can map everything onto scalar master integrals. For next to next to leading order, there are certain configurations non-planar diagrams where we, where we just don't know the integrals. So this is one part and people work on that. The other thing is at next to next to leading order the subtraction is much more complicated. And um, at the moment there's a couple of, of different ways. Um, there's one, let me call it school of thought, that, um, that, slices, that slices the phase space and the most popular one of this is what is called n slicing or n subtraction. Um, the other method is, is, a, is the attempt to do, like in, the, like in the next to leading order case, a local subtraction, and that goes under the name of antenna subtraction, I think the most involved one. Um, the problem with antenna subtraction is, um, it's, it's ki antenna subtraction is kind of sorted, um, and we could in principle push it beyond two to two processes, but, but the process as such is not superbly stable just because you have a much richer structure of divergences. So um, what was kind of, I wouldn't say easy, but relatively straightforward at next to leading order, conceptually is, is kind of solved at, at next to next to leading order, but in terms of technical implementation, there is, um, it's, it's not obvious. Hmm? Um, for the subtraction, for the slicing, um, the problem with, with slicing is, and I'll just give you the rough upshot. The problem with slicing is you identify divergent regions of phase space you cut and you say, okay, I can integrate from zero where the thing completely explodes up to some small epsilon, however it's defined kinematically. And I, and I say, okay, be, below this epsilon, I just ignore the integral and I just add it back in integrated form. Now this gives you logarithms of this epsilon. You know why? Because we have this d omega over omega dk perp over k perp, and now we have it twice. So we have up to four logs. So you get something that can be very logarithmic, and you have to have a cancellation of potentially large logarithmic terms. So that means why when you when when you do your integration, you have to vary the epsilon, and convince yourself that you converge to to a value. So so it's not fully automatic because you have to, you know, you have to eyeball it. You basically have to monitor it. So implementation-wise, probably simpler than, than subtraction. In terms of handling, probably a little bit more subtle. Hmm? And, and that is one of the reasons, apart from the integrals, why the automation of next to next leading order hasn't happened. I, I'm fairly certain it will happen in the next five years. People will sort it. It's just, you know, we, we have accumulated enough knowledge and enough technology to at some point, you know, one or two breakthroughs and then it's done, I think. But, um, okay. Um, now, let me go back to next to leading order. Everything I say about next to leading order holds also true for next to next to leading order. And um, I will give you just verbally an example in a moment. Now, next to leading order calculations have, have subtleties. And uh, the subtleties arise um, when we went from 2 to 1 or 2 to 2 processes to processes with, with higher final state multiplicity. And the reason for that is very simple. If you have a process like, say, Trillian production or jet production, you typically have only one scale in the process, the mass, the mass of the lepton pair or the PT of the jets. So, so essentially, it's a one scale problem. The reason is, okay, let me phrase it differently. The reason is two to two processes are kinematically very constrained. You have four momentum conservation. If one particle goes that way, the other particle has to go that way, pretty much. Now, 
if you go to if you go to more final state multiplicity, you immediately have many more scales. And then you have to ask yourself a couple of questions, like for instance, what is the right scale for randomization and factorization scale? Or wait a second, what happens when we look at certain observables? And there's there's two things I want to to say. The one thing is um, we we can discuss uh, um, we can discuss the scales and give you an idea about that. Um, the other is if you look at if you look at something called a K factor, which which assumes that um, the difference between next to leading order and leading order is just a constant. You start realizing that for some processes, this k factor can become really big. So naively, we know when we go say trillion, the difference between a leading order and next to leading order calculation is of the order of 10, 20, 30 percent. The really bizarre ones, like like Higgs production, with a factor of two, are driven by by some funny coincidences and uh, by the fact that it's gluons instead of quarks. But in principle, we, we, we understand the K factors very well. Now, if you go to processes with higher multiplicities, you start seeing K factors that can become gigantic, an order of magnitude or more. And um, when this was published, I think half the community was like, wow. And the other half was boring. Um, now, do you have any idea how, what can what what can drive a giant k factor, or do you want to see a plot first and then speculate? Plot. Okay. I hope I have them in the right sequence. Not quite. Okay. This is uh, this is a giant k factor. So we calculate W plus one jet at the LHC. We look at the PT of the W, and you see. Next to leading order is pretty much constant, about a factor of two or so, above the leading order. And that's okay-ish. If we go now to the PT distribution of a jet, there's a factor of two to three, but at some point it turns into an order of magnitude. Do you have any idea what, what drives this? Anyone wants to spec here? Yeah? Scale separation? Uh, more precisely, what do you mean scale separation? Large log. Large log, yeah, kind of. There is something like that, yeah. So, so doesn't matter. Yeah, does absolutely not matter. Because in the loop process, Sorry? I mean, that's because in the loop process, It's a new process, exactly. So what happens here is the following. When you calculate W plus one jet at next to at leading order, your process is a W and a jet, and they're back to back with it, to each other. Okay, so if you want to kick the W, you have to kick the jet, and if you want to have a large jet PT, you have to kick a massive particle quite violently. So you need a lot of energy. Okay. Now, at next to leading order. You have a real correction that is W plus two partons. And you can have configurations where the first jet is not recoiling against the W, but against another jet. And it's much cheaper to kick another jet. So you basically have a new process that breaks a strong kinematical correlation and this allows you to populate phase space that before that was sort of forbidden. So th that is roughly speaking what happens. And a configuration that does this, and I show it, I show it to you in another case, is it's a configuration where the W sits there without so much of a, of a transverse momentum. It's pretty much at rest, and it's two jets. So you do not, in a, in a funny way, it's a configuration that looks more like a weak correction to a strong process than like a strong correction to a weak process. Yeah? It's a naive question. I saw the k-factor should apply to the same final state, right? Even the next leading order calculation, you should have the same w plus one j. Right? Yes. Because your, your, the contribution w plus two j. Yeah, yes, but at, at next leading order, you have real correction, right? Let me go back. Yeah. 
So, your born is W plus one parton, okay? And at leading order, you stop here. At next to leading order, you do the virtual, yeah. loopy thing, and then you do the real, and that is with an extra parton, right? Nothing prevents you from, from asking the second parton to be a jet. Okay. Yeah? Now, <laughs> it's, it's a good question because what effectively happens is if you would demand that there's no second jet, then, so, so if you would veto the jet, in other words, if you would make your next to leading order calculation that is inclusive, more exclusive, you don't see this effect. Because, and this is, it's, it's, it's really good question, because what you have to, to, to keep in mind is when you do a calculation for like W plus jet, you do not calculate W plus exactly one jet. You calculate W plus jet plus X, and this X can be a jet. Okay? So whatever you calculate, you always in, are inclusive with respect to more oomph. And the only question is whether this more oomph shows up in your calculation, opens face space or not. Tricky, huh? How big is that face space effect compared to like, I mean, if you have next to the in order, I imagine you have new initial states, right? That can give you, I mean, I guess it's a glue on something. Of course, of course. Um, so, so the one thing is you open the, the digluon channel. Yeah. The other thing is you open, you also open a channel where you have, say, two valence quarks that interact with the gluon, and one of them emits a, a W. Yeah. So, so, so you get configurations that you didn't have before. So, so simply put, if, if you do a W, if you do W uh, alone, we start with say UD bar in a simple world. Let's forget about charm and strange, doesn't matter really. So we start with UD bar. We go next to leading order, we can have one gluon in the initial state, but we must keep either U or D bar. If we go one order higher, we can have two gluons in the initial state, but we can also have two U's. And we've been there before, U's, valence, open phase space because they have a lot of energy. Okay? And then it's, it's a question of cuts and definitions, which kind of process wins or if there's a winner. I, you, I'm, I'm fairly certain for every process you can divine cuts like veto jets or so that kills this effect. By, by basically closing the face, you open the face space and then your cuts close it again. Okay? What protects against uh, large K factors that's still higher order? So you have additional final state partons, for instance, still this, this pattern, even more phase space. This pattern, to some degree, will, will die out. Um, because the more multiplicity you have in the final state, you, you start filling the phase space. Yeah? There's, um, it, it's, a, it's, it's another one. There's, um, there's a conjecture. Um, I, I show you another plot and then I come with the conjecture, okay? Um, otherwise, um, I, I, I become very unstructured and that will not help you. Um, okay, so giant K factors. Subtlety, huh? You do a calculation and you have, you have to ask yourself, what do I look at? Is there other processes at higher orders that kind of open phase space and in that way slightly invalidate the order I work with? So in the example I showed you before, you would get the PT distribution of the W shape-wise quite correct, but the PT distribution of the first jet shape-wise would already look pretty botched at leading order if you compare to data. So if you had only leading order tools, you would have found new physics. Hmm? Success. New physics. Hard tail. And in fact, just, just for entertainment, in the 1980s, this is how people found a 40 GeV Cluino. by forgetting that there's radiation. So there's a, there's a lesson to be learned. Um, if you're not careful, you find new physics, um, you feel like a winner and a year later, some stupid plumber comes and yeah, says, tough, you forgot something. Looks a little bit silly. But the last impact of the invented the signature. Right? That was an absolutely superb development. <laughs> 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 I'm, it, it, it's a nice way of, it's an 
it's a nice way of seeing the positives. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but but it's still good for Tillman because he loves monojets. So um, it's all so so you see for, for Tillman there's a positive and the negative. Because deep, deep inside, he's a very optimistic person. Okay, um, let, me, let me show you something else that can be fun. So when the first, when the first NLO calculations um, came out for large multiplicities, one of the first things people calculated was W plus three jets at next to leading order. And they did it in an automated way. And because they had the, these fantastic tools, they started pushing it. And one of the things they did was they looked at the ET transverse, transverse energy or pretty much transverse momentum of a second jet in W plus three jets. And um, you get the leading order curve and it looks whatever it looks like and then you get the next leading order curve that drops like a stone and because it's a logarithmic plot you don't see that it turns negative. And a negative differential cross-section clearly doesn't exist. You, you must have made a mistake. So what happened here? What happened is pretty much related to what we discussed before. Um, the scale choice they did was for their renormalization and factorization scale, they chose the transverse mass of the W, something like PT squared plus MW squared squared of that. Okay? So in other words, they treated this W plus 2 and W plus 3 jets as QCD corrections to inclusive W production. And we all know for inclusive W production, the only, the only scale is the MW. However, when you start probing funny phase spaces, like 4, 500 GV, you start probing a phase space that is way above the scale, way above the scale of your inclusive production. So for total cross-section, this scale choice is not so completely tr tremendously bad. But if you start looking in the tails of distribution, so you start probing scales that are wildly different from what you take as randomization and factorization scale, you may run into trouble. So basically, again, it's exactly the same kinematics. If your second jet has a PT of 450 GV, it's not your W that has a PT of 450 GV. It's the other two jets that conspire. Okay? So again, we took a scale MW pretending that this process is a QCD correction to a weak process. But in this kinematic region, it's more like a weak correction to a QCD process. Because, I mean, honestly, if you ask me, you have a, you have a second jet of 450 GV. It means the first jet is even harder. The W80 GV, come on, it's a wimpy object. You get it for nearly free. I mean, apart from coupling also, but it's, it's not a biggie. <laughs> okay? So you have to be very careful what you do with scales, and you have to monitor it. Now, the, the common law is we get, scale, we get scale uncertainties right by varying scales by a factor of two. Why do we do that? We do that because we say, well, actually, randomization and factorization scale come from the fact that we can't do perturbation theory to all orders because we truncate, we have a randomization scale, and because we have the PDFs that we truncate at some point, we have a factorization scale. Yeah? So the scales are artificial, they're not physical. Nature doesn't know about factorization. It's our stupidity. Nature doesn't know about randomization scales. It's us doing perturbation theory. Nature doesn't do perturbation theory. Nature does all orders always. So randomization scale and factorization scale is entirely us. And entirely us, we defined 
the uncertainty that we have from truncating the perturbative series can be captured by varying the scales by a factor of two. You could argue whether a factor of two is good or whether you want to be conservative and take a factor of three or four. None of these factors would have helped you. And if you look at it, you see the scale uncertainty band. It's really small. And whatever you do with your scale uncertainty band, once the cross section turns negative, your central value is, is botched. Okay? So, in other words, varying by a factor of two is nice, but only if you have a meaningful scale to start with. How do you know what a meaningful scale is? <laughs> you meditate it. You, you say, oh, this looks like a good scale choice based on experience, based on my understanding of QCD, based on my religious beliefs. It's like a beige, it's, like, it's, it's, it's like a Bayesian prior, just different. Okay? So, so, so you assume something and you assume that you're smart enough to know what you do. And sometimes you are right and sometimes you're not. And if you're not, um, then you get funny results. And if you then insist that your results are right because you're smart, you look like a dodo. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's pretty much the logic, okay? So with scale choices, you have, to be, you have to be very careful because we enter, with the LHC, we enter a regime where we have many particles in the final state. Many of our signals have more than two, two hard objects in the final state. So you have to be smart. Okay, so words of warning when you go higher orders. And um, um, the tricky thing is by now we have tools to do all this stuff automatically. Okay, so you don't do your calculations by hand anymore, you press the button. And if you don't monitor what you do, you, 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 get, you, you get the line of thought, right? You have to be very, very careful because you don't own the calculations anymore. So you have to be super duper careful in validating the results. Okay. Let's go, let's go all orders. <coughs> I, I start with a simple example again. The simple example is the following. Let us say we produce a muon pair. And let me ask what the transverse momentum of the pair is. Now, There's two classes of diagrams. You either have a photon being emitted at leading order from, from the initial line or from the final line. And if, you are, and if you ask the question, what is the PT distribution of the lepton pair, the Born level doesn't give you distribution because it's just a delta function. So the first order where you have a meaningful statement about the PT distribution is when you have something against which the, the muon pair can recoil. Now, <clears throat> for the sake of the argument, because later I want to do this with QCD, let us, let us say that emissions of the leptons are not so important because the leptons are super massive or have no electrical charge or so. Yeah, let's assume they're, they're neutrinos. And we ask, what is the PT distribution of the neutrinos? Not a very good question because we can't measure it, but I just want to get rid of these diagrams, okay? So let us only look at this diagram. Now, we calculated it before. Um, so, so what I do now is the following. I calculate E plus E minus going to a gamma star, a virtual photon. That's the one that will decay into the two muons. Plus, plus, uh, plus a real photon. And I ask, what is the PT distribution of the virtual photon? Which will be exactly the same as the PT distribution of the muons coming off the decay of this thing because of momentum conservation. Now, yesterday um, I showed you, and um, you, could, you could have calculated, the result for quark anti quark going to W gluon. And it's very similar. Um, the left-handed coupling uh, falls out. 
as we said, because of, of symmetry arguments. Um, and apart from k factors and coupling constants, we can basically recycle the matrix element and replace the mass of the W with the mass Q, with the mass Q of the virtual photon. Now, I factor out the leading order cross section. What you see is the real, the real emission contribution. So, this is the, the leading order term for our PT distribution d sigma by dt d sig and by dq squared looks like um, born times 1 over q squared times something that, that will diverge when t or u go to zero. Yeah? So it's something that we saw before. It's reminiscent of the omega over omega dk perp over k perp. I just tried it in Mandel's dumps. Okay, <clears throat> now the one thing I want to introduce is uh, Q perp, the transverse momentum of the virtual photon. So I, I want to, to give it now a name. So everything with the capital Q is the virtual photon. Capital Q is the mass, capital, capital Q perp is its transverse momentum. And when I integrate over all masses, I get an Ultimately, after a little bit of, of um, dropping terms that are of order one and keeping only the logarithms because they are potentially large, I get something that looks like d sigma over dq perp squared. We get a 1 over q perp squared term and we get a log s over q perp squared. And I dropped everything that is logarithmically not relevant. So everything that is of order one or everything that looks like a log two or so all gone, okay? So, so, so we, we try to boil it down to the essentials. Or in other words, if I write as a differential cross-section, d sigma r is the born times something that will give me a log squared, right? This is d log q perp squared times log q perp squared. Um, so that's a double logarithmic approximation to the spectrum. Okay. Now, one thing that can happen is the following. If you, if you play it a little bit silly, we, cannot, we could now integrate over q perp squared, say, between minimal q perp like zero which is probably not so healthy, and s. Q perp squared zero basically means that the photon you emitted is parallel to the incoming beams, right? Because then the virtual photon doesn't have a transverse momentum. That means the emitted, the emitted real photon cannot have transverse momentum because they recoil against each other. So we must have a minimal Q perp somehow. Um, if you want to stay at fixed order. But what you see is the following. If you integrate from a minimal Q perp to an S, depending on how brutal you are with your minimal Q perp, the differential cross-section can be larger than the inclusive one. You just have to make, if you integrate from minimal to, to maximal, you get log of S over Q perp squared minimal. And if you make Q perp squared minimal as slow as you want, this thing here, this, this term here, will become significantly larger than one. It can basically take any number. Or yet differently, your PT distribution looks like this. And when you integrate, of course, you can get something. Yeah, you integrate and at some point you're larger than any number you want because this thing goes through the roof. <clears throat> so it's probably better we don't have this behavior. And this is one of the reasons why we like to resum because we say these terms here, these dangerous terms, 
I, I will try to convince you in the next step that they come every order. So if instead of one photon, I emit two photons, I will get similar logarithms. Three photons, I get even more logarithms. And they behave a little bit, well, they behave like a series that you can put together and exponentiate. So there's, people use it as, as nearly synonymous. It's nearly synonymous. And for the sake of this lecture, we can pretend it's the same. Um, what we're going to do now is we, we, we will try to exponentiate these logarithms, and I will explain to you why, and we call this a resummation. This is pretty much the logic. There are such a difference, as I've said. So, so th this is the argument, again, in a slightly more formalized form. We ask ourselves, what is, what is the integrated cross-section, so this D is wrong, for, for larger than Q min, and if you drop every term that is not not leading, not the biggest, you get something that looks like alpha log squared. But you know, but you know that the um, that the cross section is finite, right? Production of a muon pair is finite. So what happens is the following: if you integrate from zero to q perp min. So, so you have to add the virtual term. And let's say I make q perp min really small. I mean, super duper small. Then I can maybe say, OK, below q perp min, the virtual cross section lives there because the virtual cross section doesn't have a transverse momentum because it's born level. Yeah? So the virtual correction to the inclusive cross section, so this is part of the real correction, but there's also a virtual correction where you have where you have a, a safe energy. And this is something I put into the zero Q perp bin. And um, if this explodes positively, this thing here must explode negatively. That's the only way how you get a, a meaningful um, finite cross section. So if this goes like log squared, this bit here must go, go, must go like minus log squared plus some finite terms. This is exactly what we did before when we did the next leading order calculation where we cancelled real and where we cancelled the infrared divergence between real and virtual. It's exactly the same. We have an infrared divergence which comes from emitting a photon that is either soft or collinear. We realize or oh, oh, divergence because if you set Q perp squared min to zero, this thing is infinity. But if we add the virtual we know it must, it, must be, it must be finite. So to some degree, that means when you start exponentiating, which is what, what we're going to do, you implicitly take into account the fact that the virtuals are in. And I come back to that. I just want to warm you up for that. OK, so let us play the game. And instead of one emission, let's do two emissions. So the, the way it works is, if you do, if you do one emission, we, we did this trick two days ago, where we said, well, if the photon is soft or collinear, we can for, forget about the k and we just push the p through. You remember? So if we have only one photon, we get something that looks like p mu times, eps, times epsilon mu, so that's p. P, P, E, so four momentum times polarization. Now, if I do this for the first, for the first photon, and I add a second one, the second one now would have a gamma nu P plus K. And I can push it through again. So order by order, <coughs> photon by photon, I get the same factors in the limit where the Ks, where the Ks are parallel to the P, or where the, where the Ks are, are, are soft, like Ks go to zero. So, so this is what, this is the kind of term that we get. Now we have n photons. So we have e to the n, coupling to the n. But then you have a symmetry factor, because it's identical particles in the final state, n factorial. Hmm? You see where this is going? Why I say, oh yeah, no problem. We're going to have we're going to have an exponential. 
So, we take the 1 over n factorial and we take n times the thing that comes out when we integrate. And therefore we get a 1 over n factorial, something to the power of n, and that's, if you sum over all n's, that's an exponential. And that is how you make the link between one emission, identifying the leading terms that, identifying the terms that you get back order by order, and you say, well, now we put in an exponent because we have to sum over all of them. Nobody is squealing. So either, you're, either you, you've seen this before or you're completely stunned. I'm not sure what it is. Or you basically just gave in. <laughs> so, so, so honestly, when I saw this the first time, it took me, it took me a moment to go like, wow. Um, but hey. If you, don't, if you don't complain, we're going to push it further. Just because, you know, I want to see whether... Yeah? So if you ask you for stupid questions, can you explain to me again? I mean, this n factorial denominator, that's the key term that allows yeah. you to do some. So where again do you get this? How do you guarantee that it's really n factorial? Because you have n identical particles in the final state. Yeah? You won't have color. Why does it work with you? <laughs> because, because then you would have color orderings and you have n factorial color orderings and so you would, do, you would get exactly the same symmetrization factor. So it was not as stupid as I expected. <laughs> but hey, it was a great question because it interrupted it and um, if, if it would have been really stupid I would have probably said, oh this is an unorthodox question, original thought. Keep it, keep it, keep it in your head. It's an, it's an original thought. It's worth following it up. <laughs> okay, so what we do now is the following. I, I just now pull out the sigma, this one over born because it annoys me anyway. It's just a number. And my one over sigma, the sigma by dq perp, now has this form. I, I differentiate this exponential with respect to q squared. I get terms like this, and I keep this exponential. This exponential here, the sigma, goes under the name of Sudakov form factor. I'm going to reintroduce the Sudakov form factor probably tomorrow. Probably tomorrow, yeah. <clears throat> um, in, a, in a completely different way. So if, if you don't get it now, no problem. What it, what it is, what, what it really is, is the following. This exponential gives you the probability, because of the minus sign, because of the minus sign, this thing gives you the probability that your incoming electron line has not emitted a photon above a scale of q perp. Let's go back to that. So you remember the real emission comes with the positive sign and the, the non-emission part comes with the minus sign. And that's the minus sign I exponentiate. Okay? Yeah. We have a question about the, that factor. So in the q perp goes to zero limit, I'd think of that as just the collinear limit, but is that really the soft and collinear yes. logarithm? So it's yes, be, yes, because um, because um, if you want to have a q perp, a, a given q perp, you must at least have the same energy for the for the photon to have a chance. Mm -hmm. So I could have I could have made I could have made hypothetically two cuts. I could have made an angular cut and energy cut, but by using k perp, I start connecting them. So it's, it's, it's a convenient way to capture both. I, I, I'm going to rephrase it in a slightly different way tomorrow and, and you will see it a little bit better. But let me just, let me just say the following. When you do dk perp squared over k perp squared d omega over omega, naively, 
it doesn't matter in which sequence you integrate, okay? Now, if you want to integrate over d omega with a fixed k-perp, you know that the minimal omega is the minimal k-perp, is the k-perp you have. Yeah? So your d omega over omega gives you a log k-perp, and then you do d k-perp over k-perp. Yeah? Okay. So let me write it down. So let's say we do a k perp zero of d k perp over k perp, and then we have d omega over omega. What you know is, for your for your real photon to exist, its energy must be at least k perp, right? Because omega squared minus k squared must be zero. If you don't have a longitudinal component, you must, yeah? So, so that's the minimal omega you can have. Everything happy with that? Yeah, so I guess if I were to maybe rephrase that, Q perp is a parameter that really approaches the doubly singular point as it goes to yeah, zero? Yeah, 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 that's exactly the point. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I just formulate, so you get a D log, k perp times log k perp here. Hmm? And I forget every kind of upper limit here because I'm, I only want to project the logs and I fix the upper limit in the end. Yeah? That's why you get the log squared. Good. So, you get the minus sign because this is the part that doesn't emit. If you exponentiate, that's the probability for not having emitted. Now, is this a good probability? Let us check. Probabilities are numbers between 0 and 1. Exponentials of something negative are numbers between 0 and 1. So that seems to fit. What is more complicated to see is if the numbers are multiplicative, so if you then go from q perp squared to some even lower q perp. And you find out that if you take only the logarithmic term, it actually works, but if you but but you get terms that are not logarithmic on top of that, that but these are terms that I didn't take into account anyway. <coughs> okay. So <laughs> there's a problem in this. What we, did, what we did was we said we have n independent photon emissions and they can go in, let's say, let's say the, beam, the beam goes towards the camera, these k perps can go every direction. What we know is that the, that the k perp of the muon pair, the k perp of the virtual photon will, will be opposite to all the other k perps combined. So you must have something like momentum conservation in the transverse plane. In other words, you cannot do a scalar sum of photon k perps and say the scalar sum of the photon k perps is the scalar k perp of your virtual photon because you live in a two-dimensional plane. You have to do a vector sum. Now that's a little bit that's a little bit awkward. So what you have to do is you have to, in, in your spectrum, you have to introduce a delta function that keeps into account that the q-perp of the virtual photon is opposite to the sum of all, of all the k-perps of the emitted real photons. Now integrals with delta functions, not very good. Hmm? So, but the trick is, you can, you, can f you can use the beauty of Fourier transforms and go from momentum space to impact parameter space. So you, from, you go from momentum space to, to space space. And um, you Fourier transform and then you get an exponential. And that's kind of sweet because we also have an exponential of, of Q perp squared so we can kind of put exponentials together and think about as Gaussian like of integrals or stuff like that. So we, so we can get rid of stuff. 
Okay, so let us do that. I'm now going to rewrite my single emissions, every, every one of them individually, in impact parameter space. And I put it now all together. I integrate out all the impact parameters, but I keep one. I have to keep one of them, which is pretty much this one here. Hmm? I can't get rid of those, but I can get rid of, of these here because these are just Gaussian functions Gaussian forms and um, the, this guy here, this guy here, um, when I integrate over, over the 2 pi angle just becomes a Bessel function. Yeah? So I go from D to B which is, which is dependent on orientation to something that, is, that doesn't depend on orientation anymore. And the, the angle integral, it, it's, an, it's an integral over exponential of i cos theta or so, that gives you Bessel. I'm very glad that I don't do this at the blackboard. I'm very glad because that's uh, not fun. Yep? Ah, I should integrate. Yeah, I should integrate. Okay, now, so this is how you would do it in QED, but we're not interested in QED. QED is for, let me call them interested amateurs, right? We do QCD. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we do exactly the same in QCD. No, it's, uh, okay, if you, if you push QED at some point it becomes as, as bad as QCD. Just not as colorful. It's just not as colorful. <laughs> But, but instead you want to, to know everything much more precise because QD is much more easier and then you go to much higher loops. Yep? Um, the previous line. Yeah. So the integrand doesn't seem to have any similarity to the B. Here? Yeah. Is that the right thing? Um. I have the feeling I have the feeling I, I may have missed the one over q perp squared here. I, I have to I, I'm, I'm not entirely I'm not entirely certain. I mean you, you get um, no no actually no it's not true. You um, your divergent structures are all in this in this Sudakov like structure. Because you so what what this exponentiation actually does let me, let me go to that plot, is this. It, it takes, it takes the, the, the large logarithms and because it exponentiates them with a minus sign, they get pushed and the difference in cross-section gets, gets kind of smeared in the larger q perp region, okay? But I'm going to check whether I forgot a factor of, of whether I forgot a factor here. I look at it and it looks a little bit fishy. So let me let me check them. So in in QCD, in QCD it's uh, we do exactly the same. So we take our leading order, we take our leading order inclusive cross section, the thing that we calculated before. We have the same Bessel, and then we have a term, this W tilde ij, which is pretty much this term. But if we want to, if we want to make it more precise, so if we want to, to push it to higher orders, we have to, to, to modify them. So, um, so at, at leading log, this is just an exponential, but you know, because it's, it's QCD, we have PDFs in there, so, so we have to look a little bit more carefully. Yeah, there's, there's no PDFs here, so the PDFs are kind of in here with an integral over x1, x2, and we have, we have to look a little bit. That's why it's a W 
twiddle. So this thing incorporates the Sudakov form factor as before. That's pretty much the same thing at, that we had before, but in contrast to the, to the kind of toy example, we now do PDFs, and if you want to include higher orders, they go all in here. So let us look at this uh, WIJ. So at leading log accuracy, that's the accuracy that we had before. As, sure. Yes. Yeah. That's exactly. So, so when I go now to QCD, I have in mind that we have a QCD production of a muon pair. That's, that's why I was so eager to get rid of the photons out of the muons to just transfer it. Okay? So we have gluon emissions now of the initial state and the final state is two muons. <clears throat> so we have now our two PDFs and you see something. You see that I now say Actually, the factorization scale is the inverse of the impact parameter. So this 1 over b perp is something of the order of q perp. Yep, they, they are kind of they are connected with each other through this exponential. So, or in other words, when you go from imp, from for momentum space to configuration space, you invert. So this is of the order of, th these guys here of the order of Q perp. These guys here of the, are of the order of Q perp. And then we have dk perp squared over k perp squared, a over k perp squared, log q, q k perp squared. And why do I, why did I put a of k perp squared? Well, there's a, there's, a color, there's a color charge. If your, if your initial state is quarks, like in the case of Trellian, you have quark anti quark, there's a CF. If you do Higgs, you have two gluons, then there's a CA. On top of that, we have alpha S. So, we ha so, so this A is either CF or CA times alpha S over K perp squared. And I forget about factors of pi, so I'll make it more precise in the next slide. Yeah, so it's so this thing here is the same thing that we had here. Integrate instead of alpha over pi, I have alpha s over pi, and I have color factors. Okay. So that's the full beauty result. Let us let us forget this for a moment. This is I, I come back to that or not? I, I'll see. Um, <coughs> so. So now we, now we take a closer look at what we do when we want to be more precise with our Ws. As before, these are our PDFs. But now when I start emitting, now when I start emitting and I want to do higher order corrections, you remember there were correction terms in higher order corrections on the PDFs that, that behaved like splitting functions. Do you remember those from the fixed order? These guys sit in here. Yeah? Stuff that has to do with the fact that you go to higher orders, then you have to take your PDFs at higher orders and, and you get these splitting function type terms inserted. Then you may have some genuine loop corrections. So let us go back, let us go back to the fixed order and take a look what this what this means. So the PDF part are terms like this. Yeah? And the genuine loop corrections are terms like these. Okay? I wait for color. Okay. And then we have our pseudocop form factor. And now I just want to, to, to play a little bit with your brains. Um, there's a term that looks like log squared, but we had terms that look like a single log. It's these ones here. Yeah. So, hypothetically speaking, depending on the accuracy, 
our determination and our ability to calculate, we could, we could now start to expand everything in orders of alpha s. At, at zeroth order in alpha s, these are just delta functions. This thing here is just the one. And then we have one order in, we can have one order in alpha here and one order in alpha here. Or we can have two and one. It depends a little bit on how we want to, how we want to resum. Um, mind you, these guys here, logarithmically speaking, are larger than those, right? Because this guy gives you two logarithms and this guy only gives you one logarithm. <coughs> so what do they look like? A1, first order, for, for, so your A looks like alpha S over 2 pi times order. At leading order you have either 2CF or 2CA. At second order, it's beautiful, you get, you get this, this interesting term K. Um, and it, it's a, this is the genuine higher order correction to the emission of a soft gluon. So it's a process independent correction and it turns out that at also the third A3 um, has absolutely no process dependence, it has absolutely no kinematic dependence. And um, the B1 for quarks looks like minus 3CF and for the gluon it looks like better not. When we discuss parton showers tomorrow, we will realize that these are the finite terms of the splitting function integrated over Z. So the splitting function that we introduced two lectures before, you remember this 1 plus Z squared divided by 1 minus Z. I can write this 1 plus Z squared divided by 1 minus Z in the limit where Z goes to 1, looks like 2 over 1 minus Z plus some finite stuff. Um, the finite stuff integrated over Z gives me a three half or so. And for the for the gluon, the finite stuff gives you something like a better naught. Yeah. So you see the splitting functions again, and you see the non-soft because the what the two over one minus Z part is this thing here, right? That's the double log. Um, you see the you see the non-logarithmic part, the hard collinear part integrated over Z as a number. Yeah, so, so there's a connection between these these terms here and what is in your splitting functions, and it's important to realize that. Okay. Um, as I've said, C naught just the delta function C1 has terms. Has a, has a term, this is the splitting function, this is the, the epsilon expansion of the splitting function. So you remember in our next to leading order correction we had something like 1 over epsilon splitting function. The 1 over epsilon splitting function gives you a logarithm, but then the splitting function has a term that is proportional to epsilon that cancels with 1 over epsilon, that gives you this guy here. And then you get some finite stuff, which is pretty much an endpoint, which comes out of the out of the plus out of the plus uh, prescription of the splitting function. So, so to some degree, the ingredients in your resummation are, are very tightly linked to higher order how you do a higher order calculation and what your splitting functions are. You, in, in a way, you, you can't have one without calculating the other. So if you want to go to higher orders in resummation, you have to understand higher orders in fixed order first to extract important terms like, for instance, splitting function at higher orders. So you can imagine if I want to do C2, I will get P2. And so you want to resum, you, you don't get it for free. It's something that people assume, oh, we resum and oh, it's all generic and we get it for free. You, you have to harvest results from the fixed order calculation and kick it in shape. Okay, so, so that is QT resummation. And this is, this is what it boils down to. <clears throat> so at fixed order, the thing explodes. When you start resumming, 
you get the red curve. And now I added the y. The y is um, is the y is the following. I could take my result of the with the w, expand it to first order and alpha s. Right? I have all possible terms: exponential, not exponential. I take the full thing, expand it to order alpha s. It gives me whatever result. It doesn't look pretty, by the way. But then I say, well, wait a second. <laughs> I know how to calculate this thing. I know how to calculate W plus gluon. And the difference between the expansion of my resumation and the known fixed order, that's this Y. And you see, in the region where the logarithms are large, the difference between resumation and fixed order is zero, as it should be. But when you go to larger transverse momenta, the logarithms alone don't do it because as q perp becomes larger, the logarithms of q perp become smaller because it's log of s over q perp. And so your finite terms, relatively speaking, become more visible. So in other words, if you want to resum and you're happy until, say, 15, 20 GV, probably you never have to think about how to, how to match this. That's the magical word here, how to match your resummation to fixed order. But if you want your result to hold over a, a larger range, at some point your Q-perp is not logarithmic anymore and then you have to go to finite terms, which gives you pi squareds and seven halves and God knows what. Okay, I have five more minutes, which is absolutely superb because then I can do a last thing. So what I showed you is a resumation where we identified that emissions give us a logarithm and we exponentiated the logarithms of, of something that is kinematical, like the transverse momentum. And we could do this because in order to have a transverse momentum we would have to have something that provides the recoil and we kind of resumed the logarithmic structures in the recoil. Now, threshold resumation does something different. <clears throat> um, let us say you want to produce a W or Z boson. Um, and let us assume they are stable particles. Uh, okay, let us just for the fun assume they're stable. So we know they have a very, very specific mass, 80 or 91 GV. And now we have our wonderful LHC, which produces quark, and we have quarks inside the protons. And it's entirely possible that some of the quarks have energies that are just above the 90, 91 GV. So if these guys would emit a little bit, then they would fall onto the threshold of the W or the Z, and we could produce it which we can't if we have a mismatch of energies. Okay, in real life, Ws and Zs are smeared out because they have a finite lifetime. So, you would f so by emitting gluons, you fall up or you move up a bright Wigner. And that's good for your cross-section because if you're on peak of the bright Wigner, the cross-section is larger compared to when you're two or three widths of peak. Yeah? So, so, so the emission of soft gluons can help you to hit a configuration that is kinematically advantageous. If you would do it in QED, this, this thing would go under the name of radiative return. Have you heard of radiative return before? There's an interesting context in QED for radiative return. Um, when people do the G minus 2 calculations, you know, G minus 2 for the muon, um, they have to do a photonic correction to the muon photon vertex. And if you push it, at some point you have to introduce a QCD loop into the photon. I draw it for you. You have diagrams like these, but then 
you can add quarks. And at low energies, these quarks are pions. Now, if you want to measure this pion loop, um, you have to use dispersion relations, etc., and you rely on measurements. So you have to you have to know the two pion production cross section independence on the mass of the pions. But typically, your e plus e minus colliders work at a fixed energy. So initial state radiation of of photons reduces the center of mass energy of your electrons and gives you a photon at different energies. So what it helps you, what it helps you is, so emissions like this mean that your photon can be at, at practically all masses. And um, if you have resonance, like for instance a row, then you have the same bright Wigner shape and with radiative return you fall onto that thing. Yeah? So it exists in QD, but it exists also in QCD. Now, the catch is the following. The catch is the following. When you do this, you have the full phase space of loop corrections, but in order to fall onto this threshold, you don't have the full phase space of real emissions. Right? Because you only want to have a couple of soft of soft gluons or soft photons to fall down on your threshold. Your gluon cannot have infinite energy or very big energy because then you would pass the threshold. So you have a mismatch of real and virtual corrections, and that gives you logarithms that actually change the cross section. And you can resum these logarithms as a threshold. So so threshold locks are an effect of a squeezed phase space. So now we have two kinds of locks. We have a lock where we want to investigate a, a kinematical situation where something gets a push and we want to see how we push it. There's another emergence of locks is when we start taking phase space away. So one is we get locks by populating phase space. The other one is we get locks by taking phase space away. See, it's the same logic. It has to do with how you cancel real versus virtual and depending on how you define your phase space, you allow real in or not. And the not allowing in of phase space gives you logarithm. And if you're lucky or unlucky, depending on how you look at it, this logarithm is big and you have to resum it. Okay. Yeah, okay, blah, 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 blah. Um, that is what I wanted to say for today. Tomorrow we do a little bit of parton showering and I, I have to, to check my slides whether I have uh, enough to torture you with. Um, although, uh, I will have enough to torture you with. Okay. <laughs> Questions left? Yes, no, maybe? Uh, yes. So I think the